Welcome to the next webinar in the series for the preparation for practice. Rex and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and emerging. I would like to welcome my co-convener, Ms Marilyn Raj, who will share with me uh, as well uh, some of our surgical experience on the topic tonight. Over the past few weeks, we've covered a heck of a lot of topics relating to setting up your practice, but now it's time to reach out to referrers and get some patients so you can actually do some work. You also need to set up somewhere to see patients, and that will be the topic of our talk today. So our webinar tonight is on building a referral base and rooms fit out. Our speakers will be Caroline Chaplin from Rooms with Style and Nicole Yap, previous deputy chair of the RACS Victoria. Firstly, as usual, please use the chat function on your webinar to shoot through those questions so we can ask our presenters at the end of the webinar. And again, may I please ask you to uh, fill in the uh, uh, the forms at the end to give us some feedback on our uh, various webinars. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Caroline Chaplin. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to be back, although, albeit in different circumstances, we're all in the comfort of our own kind of lounge rooms and things, which is, which is great. Um, so I'm just going to screen share with you um, a presentation before before I, I guess I do that, I just wanted to say um, I've been doing this a long time now, about 14 years, and not a lot has changed. You know, you'd think doctors coming through, they'd be different, things would have changed somewhat, but not really. I think these days doctors coming through are more IT savvy, but they still don't know a lot about business, and why would they? They've been studying the whole time. So if you feel like that and you think, oh, my God, private practice, you know, what am I going to be doing? I, I haven't got the first clue. That's fine. You're in good company, but you're all very clever people and you'll learn very quickly. And I always say to my doctors, you know, do you think you could teach me how to suture? And most of them say, well, yeah, eventually. And I say, well, it's exactly the same as this. And I bet you you'll pick it up a lot faster than I ever would pick up uh, suturing. So without any further ado, we'll keep going and we'll have a look at a, a screen share. Um, document now. So, okay. So the first slide here. The guy in the green. That's how I want you to be, and I want to see you in ten years like that. Too many doctors I see like the poor lady on the right. So today I'm going to give you my top ten tips on getting started in practice, everything from staff, location, rooms, everything that I've learned over the time that I think will be of the most benefit um, to you. Okay, so we've got some two bloody awful looking cakes here that I found on the internet, but they illustrate my point. So what I want you to think about is tip one, get your balance right from the start. Think about not only your surgery, but think about your family, your private practice, your health, your public practice, if you've got one, and your personal goals. Don't forget the personal goals because we get two types of phone calls at my office. One is a startup doctor like yourself, and the other is a doctor that I can profile to the letter. He'll be, 20, he'll be 52 years old and he'll be very unhappy. I was promised this and I thought this and I went in with an associate and I, it's all going pear-shaped. I'm not seeing the operations I want. They get very out of balance very fast. So think about what are all the areas of your cake. It's not for me to decide the areas of your cake. You might not have an immediate family, say, for example. It might be a dog. It might be playing soccer in the park. What is it that makes you happy as a person? Consider your private practice and think, you know, what do I want from this? What makes me feel satisfied? And I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the doctors that I see don't say money. You know, money is a byproduct. They, what they say is, I want to feel like I'm making a difference. I want to feel like I matter. 
and I want to feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives, making them feel not just healthier, but, but happier and things as well. Always remember an orthopod that I worked for, for uh, I'm still working for him today and he was my very first client. We've become quite good friends over the time. And I remember saying to him, he's got four kids. You would all know him very well. I won't mention his name, of course, but he said to me, you know what? I just want to see my kids. I want to make sure I see them grow up. So we held precious his Friday afternoons and come rain, hail or shine, he hasn't given away his Friday afternoon and it's been quite a feat considering the roles and things that he has taken, taken on. Um, actually, before I go to that slide, I wanted to say to you, think about what drives you in practice. Think about what drives you as a person. And so if I can get into your headspace for a minute, I want you to think about three fears. So the three fears in life are not being good enough, not being loved, and not being valued by your colleagues. Now, usually when I'd be seeing you face to face, I'd ask you this question, but when I've asked that question before, unanimously, surgeons have put their hand up for number three. They're worried about losing face in front of their colleagues and not being good enough in front of colleagues. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. When you're making decisions in your business, I think I think you have to consider collegiate uh, support and relationships. You need those. I 100% get that. But don't let it be your main driving force. So I had an ENT doctor the other day who said to me, Caroline, I just don't want to set up here or here because such and such is there. And I don't want to do that because that might ruffle feathers. We had a um, surgeon in Perth who ended up getting it set up. We set up his business cards. He set up his logo, his look, his everything. He's happy as Larry and everything was going well. He receives a letter from a doctor, a group of doctors, head honchos, let's call them, a, a few kilometres away. I can't believe you've done this. I can't believe you've set up and I can't believe you've used a name similar to us. Now, what was similar in the name was the word orthopaedics. So what's he supposed to do? You know, obviously he's got to use that word. So... This is something where I said to this doctor, look, I understand it. Collegiate relationships are really important. What would you like to do? Now, in that particular case, he decided to make changes. Okay, fine. It's not for me to criticise at all. So go back to that layer of the cake. It's all these layers that we're thinking about together. You know, the balancing act of I've got to get along with people uh, versus what's a sound business decision. But just think about it before you do do anything in private practice. Websites are a really good example. When you write a website, you're writing the content for your patients. Your GPs aren't going to look at it. They'll hardly ever look at it. I'd be surprised if they did. Um, and you're certainly not writing it for other surgeons, yet so many people get so worried about that and worry that, if, you know, are they doing it, are they doing it right or whatever um, and so forth, that their colleagues would be happy. So think about what fear is controlling you. Before I go over to the next slide, I want to talk about what type of doctor that you'll be in private practice. Um, and this is the first type that I see. The acorn protector or the squirrel. So the squirrel, what do they do? They, hit on, they hold on to all their, their acorns. I used to write there, they sit on their nuts, but I had to change it for politically correct reasons. Um, this person can't decide, you know, they, they cost cut, they don't spend, they don't understand that you have to spend money to make money in private practice in any business. Um, they can tend to consult everywhere. I don't want to lose the opportunity over there or over here, so I'll be everywhere. And all they end up doing is diluting their business. This is the person who sits up at night gets really tired and is not, uh, you know, focused the next day because they're building, they're building their own website. And, oh, Caroline, guess what? I've got this great website. It's only cost me $300 to do it myself. But it doesn't rank. No one can find you. Um, so it's the same example as the suturing from before. If I had an operation, I wouldn't be suturing myself and saying, can you give me 15% off and I'll do my own suturing? I can get you to do it because you're the expert at it. So think about, I'm going to talk a little bit about where you make money and where you don't in private practice, but really think about not being the acorn protector because a lot of doctors are. And I see that they're very slow to develop their referral patterns. The next type is the entrepreneur. Now, you don't see a lot of entrepreneurs in medicine. You might see about 10%. Um, they can be very driven, 
and they can have a clear plan for their private practice and that can be great. I always remember a doctor who saw me at the college, I started working for him after this talk and he said to me, I know what I want, I want to be this, I want to be known for this and so forth and he did it in a very non-arrogant way and he ended up uh, becoming a bit of a doyen of that particular uh, specialty that he was, he was doing, a subspecialty. So it can be done. But often the entrepreneur, if you go in too hard, boots and all, you can end up not having collegiate relationships or harming collegiate relationships. And also, I always remember a urologist saying to me, Caroline, you know what, before I knew robotic surgery, all these guys used to have a beer with me on a Friday and now they won't look at me. So the entrepreneur can have their difficulties as well. It's not as, as kind of sexy as it sounds. So the majority of doctors we see, and this is what I recommend for you, is the balanced and ethical doctor. I call it the conservative doctor. So someone who doesn't want to purport what they're not, they don't want to do cheesy, salesy, you know, Facebook things. Oh, I made scones at the practice today. That's all rubbish. And that doesn't create good, long-lasting relationships that underpin your business. This doctor knows they need some help, but they're good doctors and ethical people. They just need a bit of help with their vision and their strategy. So they concentrate on being a doctor, we concentrate on building their referral base for them. So that's the doctor I want you to aim for and think about when you're in your private practice, if you haven't started yet, or if you have already. And say to yourself, you know, I'm being a squirrel here. I'm making a silly decision. Check yourself with these things. So the next tip, tip four. When you start private practice, it's really important that you keep your costs down. It's a big old money pit at the start. It can feel like that. And you're not getting a lot of referrals through. That's normal. Everybody feels like that. And if you're doing some promotional work, your referrals will actually cost you money. But that's a good thing because you're investing in a future return. So try to think about at your practice, what's delegable and what's non-delegable, what's billable and what's not billable. So for example, your clinical work, well, I can't come in and do that for you. No one can, that's you. And there's certain as aspects of your admin and things that you're going to have to do yourself. So for example, your CPD points. There's not a lot that's delegable and billable, particularly at the start. Now, down the track, you might get a nurse that, help, you know, that there's someone else at the practice can create revenue and associate and so forth. But at the start, think about what support systems you can outsource. Again, I wouldn't do my suturing. So just think about that because it's a smart decision. Spend your time doing more clinical and attracting more clinical, building referral relationships that, again, I can't say this statement enough, that will underpin your practice for your life in practice. It really will. You don't need a lot of referrers. You need good referrers uh, that you have a very befitting relationship with. Now let's look at staff. So before I actually talk about staff, don't feel like you've got to jump in and buy rooms either. I'm going to talk about rooms in the next few slides, but that's something else. Staff and rooms are two things at the start that don't make you money. They just cost you money. So you want to keep those things down. You want to get on and start building this referral base because you're going to have costs that come in anyway. Your professional indemnity, your electricity, all of those things are going to be there anyway. It's time to get on and start making revenue coming through the door. And the type of revenue, look, I could do a whole talk just on that, to be honest, but the type of revenue, at the start, you want to tell the market who you are. What is it that you do and what do you like doing? What type of doctor are you? So you can shape your future practice. Now let's have a look at the staffing journey. So how can we keep costs down? And the golden rule is here, we keep the costs down without uh, you know, shooting in the foot our brand. So we look at it at the start, and I've put a guideline of time there. That's typical what I see, but you might be slightly different to this. So. In the first six months, say, try to keep your costs down. You might get a husband or wife taking your call. It might be your sister. As long as it's done effectively and it's okay for your brand, great. It's a love job. It's not costing you anything. When you're ready, you can also progress to some back office. So, for example, we do virtual reception so we can take your calls, pay your bills, do whatever you need at the start. Don't take your calls yourself. It just doesn't look professional. So, And it's not expensive. Um, so. Start that way rather than hiring staff. You really only need staff 
for the meet and greet part. So you might be at the hospital, say for example, and the hospital will provide someone or you're sharing rooms and so forth. Once you know that that's starting to not work, now usually the triggers are things like you've got no control over it, so Mary who's answering your phones is starting to, no, I don't know he's free there, I'm not his secretary, and that sort of thing's starting to happen, it's time to move on. It's affecting your brand. So the second stage can be do virtual reception full time. Keep that going as much as you can and just get a bum on seat for the times that you're consulting. When you are ready to hire, what we recommend is that you hire a part-timer to start with. And remember that this person is not a practice manager. You're a startup doctor. You do not call them practice manager because they will take advantage of you. And then what happens is when you go to hire a second person, the first person starts to patch protect and I'm the manager and whatever. You don't, you're not the managers just because you're the first person in. It might be years down the track till you'll actually need a practice manager as such. So be careful because this is an example of how you start is how you finish. Um, it's really, really important to control staff. I can tell you, and I'm sure that the, the conveners here tonight would, would uh, support me on this, all your grief's going to come from staff, trust me. So we really need to make sure we've got good controls over the staff at the start. Don't launch into staff immediately. I usually say get one part-timer, then we'll get another part-timer. Depends, depends on how busy you are and so forth. And then we support you with temporary telephone diversion, which means someone wants to go on holidays or whatever's happening. Um, what we do then is we take your calls for the, the day or the week or whatever has to happen. Um, also, let me just say on staff, although I'm sure somebody potentially has already spoken on staff, just remember that if you hire somebody who ticks all the clinical boxes, they may not have the presence or the, the niceties on the phone. You can't measure how often that phone didn't ring. Particularly at the start, don't be tempted to hire someone who ticks every clinical box but doesn't tick the marketing box, if you like. Um, because that person can also very much hold you to ransom. I've got a gastroenterologist at the moment. This is exactly what's happening from him, for him. So what we're doing is we're getting all the documents. He's never had anything documented, you know. She was really good. She's a star, you know. Don't fall in love with the lady at the desk or the guy at the desk for that matter. Um, it can shoot you in the foot very quickly, especially when number two comes along. So in the gastroenterologist example, what's happening is um, that gastroenterologist is uh, panicking because nothing's documented. So what we've done is come in, do some virtual reception, and all this is being done so the person doesn't, be, doesn't feel threatened because he doesn't want her to walk out the door. But slowly but surely, we're able to learn the business. We've hired a second person now, and now he understands the pain of not having a practice handbook. I'm not saying that a practice handbook doesn't mean you still don't feel some grief. If you get some grief from staff, makes it a lot easier. And also documentation around, you know, what are the KPIs here? So that when someone's needing to be performance managed, it's easier because you can say, well, hang on a minute, you're supposed to do this three times a week and you're not. It's quantifiable, it's easier to, uh, to measure and to move people on and so forth. Anyway, like I said, I could go on about that talk uh, all, particular, all day. Um, now let's have a look at rooms. So remember I said to you, don't feel like you've got to buy rooms. Doctors don't know, GPs and your referrers, where you're renting or you feel like the you know, poor cousin in rooms and all of that. So certainly don't tell the GPs that. Just be confident, you know, build it and they will come. So you go forward and you sort of say to the GPs, yeah, I'm in rooms at such and such. Yeah, that's terrific. Don't worry about later on you'll be able to buy rooms or you'll be able to lease your own rooms, whatever you're doing. Um, and we find that as long as you're in the same locale, in other words, you're not 50 Ks in a, in a different area, GPs don't mind that at all. You just say simply that, hey, we're moving to new rooms that facilitate your patients in a much better way. As a courtesy to you, I'll, I'll come and see you and tell you all about it. Uh, we don't see people miss, a, miss a, um, a stepping stone with that. Also on that point, if you are moving rooms, make sure you tell your uh, referrers repeated times. People are busy. We send out moving cards, send a letter, make calls and so forth. That's your goal. Do not let, let go of your referrer base. So what choices do you have regarding rooms? Well, you can buy 
you can rent or you can share or have some sort of associateship arrangement. Let's look at the positives and negatives that we've seen over the years from those three things. So when it comes to buying, buying can be good from a point of view that you might have capital growth. In today's scenario, it's a little bit tricky. Just make sure these things happen before you buy. Does the layout meet your requirements? Now that might sound obvious, but think about patient flow, um, think about staff flow, think about your own flow and your privacy when you're there. Think about the size of the rooms, what you're going to be using them for. Again, that could be a full talk in itself. Ring me up, ask me the question. Before you buy something, say, Caroline, come and look at it. Um, I don't want to make a mistake. You know, it'd be silly to buy something and, and only to find that it's not right. Will you need to renovate it? If you need to renovate it, you might trigger off building permit. Now, if you trigger off a building permit, so let's say, for example, the doorways are not wide enough or the disabled toilet, there isn't one and we need to put one in. Sometimes in doing that, you can then affect your planning permit. So your planning and permitted use permit was the permit that said, yep, you can be a doctor here at these suites. And then you thought, that's great. I'm just going to move in and I'm going to renovate. Now, I had an obstetrician, for example, so he went and bought these rooms around the corner from his own rooms and they didn't have a planning permit in place at all. And he said, that's fine, I'll apply for the planning permit. So by the time I came along, he had his planning permit fantastic and he said Caroline now can you help me can you help me set up and so forth and I said I can but unfortunately inside the rooms here none of the rooms meet today's requirements in relation to doorways and things now if it was an existing practice sometimes you're not triggering the need for all of these things but because it wasn't a practice at all it was it was all today's standards that are Applied. So that was go going to be such an expensive renovation that he ended up, we ended up just getting tenants in, uh, domestic tenants, and then he sold the property. And that's okay. You know, he didn't make a massive loss or whatever, but it would have been much easier if he had found, found out about that before. So just be careful about that. Um, I always think of a, a Sydney guy who, uh, ENT guy, and he was opening up rooms and he ha just hadn't read the fine print. Um, and he wasn't allowed to have signage in the area that he was in. It was a commercial fit out. It might seem like a small thing, but signage, you know, people are struggling to find him. It created a lot of drama because he'd already gone ahead with the, the sale. So what I say to you is, you're not an expert at that. It's just, if I had a lump somewhere, I'm coming to see you. You're going to tell me what it is. I'm not going to self-diagnose on Google. Um, so it's the same thing with you. Just pick up the phone and, and ask the question and we'll point you in the right direction. The second thing that you consider uh, could consider to do is rent. Now, always get a lawyer to check the rental agreements. Over the years, we've seen many strange and wonderful things in rental agreements. Uh, for example, I've got one down there, the make good clause. Always remember doing up rooms for a plastic surgeon and on his lease, there was a make good clause. So we carefully uh, packaged up the existing drapes that were in the property. We put them in boxes and we sealed the boxes and put them in the back room. The guy who he was renting from was a total nut job, uh, like that woman from Bunnings, a bit that way. And uh, he said, oh my God, you've wrecked my drapes to the doctor. They're worth a hundred grand, these you know, drapes. And because the make good clause actually says that you're supposed to put those drapes back up and have it as it was. So the, the best thing I can tell you there is just be very careful and and make sure you get um, us to look at it before you sign and we'll also refer it on to our legal um, people so that you're not signing something that has um, you know hidden things that you, you can't you, you can't possibly know about owners corp is a, a really good one in melbourne in berwick for example one of our doctors was looking to um, rent a place there and there was this bizarre owners corp scenario where he had to maintain the outside of the building uh, the whole building. What? So these things can sneak up on you and you're not sure. The other thing, before you buy or you rent, just make sure your permit allows you to have the number of practitioners that you, you, you want to have there and be aware too of what hours you can consult. Can you consult on a Saturday or a Sunday or, or what can happen? And make sure you know those things. They might not be deal breakers, but they're important to know nonetheless. And the last one, um, what if you share? Now, see this guy, I don't know who this is. I got this from just a Google picture or whatever. So it's no one any of us know. 
I hope. Uh, so anyway, see this guy, beware this guy, because he's going to promise you the world and deliver nothing. So what I see time and time and time again is this guy promised the young surgeon, hey, you can come with me and I'm going to give you A, B and C and you're going to take over my business and I'm going to retire in two years or whatever else. Nine times out of ten, it doesn't happen. So I understand sometimes if the big head honcho is telling you, come with me, that could be a golden opportunity. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying go into it with open eyes um, and make your own way. Make your own journey as well. You know, make sure if you're sharing with someone, if you get too tied into their brand and you don't have a list of your referrers, well, when they boot you out the door and that happens, happens all the time, Time. I can tell you already at least five cases of that this year that we've had to deal with. Um, when that happens, you might say, oh, but legally they can't do that and whatever, but by the time you fight a legal battle, the damage has been done. So make sure you know who your referrers are um, so that you're not just completely relying on that practice and understand how the processes work so that if you are booted out, you will be able to survive, you know. I had an incident a couple of months ago. I won't even say the specialty because some of you will probably know what I'm talking about, where the day the doctor said that he was leaving, the older surgeon said, basically, get out. And he had to walk past his patients in the waiting room and go. And it was a soul-destroying, shocking scenario. And that doctor the whole time said to me, I think I'll be fine. I don't think they'll do that. And, and so forth. We've got a couple of um, doctors, again, I won't say the specialty because you'll be able to figure out who it is, in Sydney at the moment, who broke up with a, a group. Um, and the other group has been ringing around the practices saying, oh, no, I'm sorry, he's gone back to, uh, you know, Kenya to live or wherever. I'm just making up that so you can't work out who I'm talking about. Um, be careful, do not rely on promises. It can look like an easy option. And then what you end up happening, and what ends up happening is you just get the rubbish. So instead of developing yourself, say you're a hip surgeon, I want to be a hip arthroscopy specialist, what ends up happening is you get the lumps and bumps and things that don't convert to surgery, which affects you from a financial point of view, but also just from a what you want to do and what you studied for. You know, you study a long time to do this. Um, I've got some doctors at the moment who have said to me that the older guys have done this to them. They've winked at them. Don't worry, mate, your time will come. Well, how long are you going to wait for that? So I'm just saying to you again, that gets back to that layer in the cake there. How long are you going to put up with that before you move on and make your own way? And when you do start making your own way, whether you like it or not, they're going to get the shits. And I've never seen that any different. Because it's jealousy, it's human nature, you're moving on, you're taking part of my market share, all of those sorts of things. If you find somebody that, that all that doesn't happen, then awesome. But I'm telling you what I mainly, mainly see. The other thing with this is when you share, often the receptionists treat you like a poor cousin. And so, no, I won't be doing your thing. You know, computer says, no, I won't be helping you today because I've got to do Dr. Smith's A, B and C. I had a doctor where leads were coming in from GPs and things and people weren't being rung back, uh, called back for two weeks. What? You know, you cannot survive on this. And, you know, it's tempting at the start. It's not going to cost me. It's going to be a safe haven. But as soon as it starts affecting your brand, it's time to move on. Okay. Now, after all that scary talk, are you still thinking of renovating? Now, if you are... Um, and I don't think a lot of you will be thinking of renovating at the moment, but these are the kind of top tips of things to be aware of. Buyer beware or renter beware of these things. Is the permit in place? So I talked a little bit about that. Have you got your planning permit in place? Is your compliance there? Because as I said, you could have a planning permit and then it ends up getting voided by a building permit. Um, I can think of a very well-known medical precinct where the doctor went in, had the planning permit, the building permit made him have to change the veranda to have disabled access, that voided his planning permit. So he can be 18 months back at council trying to fix that problem. So just find out that that's still okay. I see a lot of problems with air conditioning and heating. Because you need your doors shut, what ends up happening is, and whatever practice you're at at the moment, you're probably already finding this, your room's boiling, 
and the staff are freezing and so forth. So just check that everything is in place in relation to that because that can be very expensive to put in extra heads and so forth. You can be looking at 30 grand to just put in a few more units. So just check when you go in. If I'm going to partition these rooms, will I be able to have a unit in each room? Is there enough heads on the main unit? Check the internet speed. So many people forget to do this one and then their pathology results, their radiology have problems with all of these things. Phone lines. I did up rooms in Footscray and I was caught out. There was no phone lines connected. Go figure. It was a main street of, of Footscray. It's something you wouldn't um, predict. Um, I can think of another practice where there was no gas connected. We're not talking about in the sticks here. We're talking about in the CBD. So these things are things that we check out firstly because they can be expensive things. Again, not necessarily deal breakers, just expensive things. Plumbing is a big one. Will you be able to put sinks in? So a lot of the new facilities today, they're concreted in a way that there's a mesh running through the whole concrete. You can't necessarily stick a sink anywhere in that room. So when you go and you look at the room, you go, great, I'll put my sink over there and I'll do this, that and the other. And you might find you can't put a sink in it at all. Or it has to be plumbed in um, in a way that's, you know, uh, very expensive, like super expensive. So you want to avoid that. Those little fire extinguisher things, those things on the roof, the sprinklers can give you massive grief. So that can be very expensive where the whole building has to be shut down. You get a great big fee to accommodate for that whilst they all get moved and sorted. So if you can, and you can sort out your floor plan without moving any of them, great. Not necessarily, again, a deal breaker, but something I want you to consider. Last thing I put there was chairs. People are getting bigger and bigger. Don't scrimp on chairs. Get proper commercial chairs that will last the distance. Not only from an aesthetic point of view, but from a, uh, if a, the chair breaks point of view. So plenty of doctors are going out and buying rubbish from office works uh, and paying the price. So don't, don't let that be you. I hope I'm going okay time-wise because I'm wrapping yeah, up. just a couple of minutes to go, Caroline. All right. All right, we'll see. I'll try and get through this. So where do we locate? When you locate, consider your demographic. What type of patients are you trying to attract? Consider your competitors. But don't be frightened of your competitors. You know, sometimes people for political reasons don't want to be somewhere. But the thing I'd say to you most is don't be in too many consulting locations. Think of yourself as lying across a ravine. You've got your fingernails and you've got your toenails on the other side. Let go. Build one area. Build one section. Because you're just going to spend your whole life in the car. And it won't be effective. So I've just put a couple of maps here that show typically how people might um, might market so that they're not they're developing relationships along a corridor and whatever so come and see us and we'll set that up for you think about your lifestyle too you know what sort of patients do you want to see what place do you like to consult in is it attracting what you want there's another example there as well and I'm sure everyone's giving you the slides so that'll give you something to have a look at when you're at home so my next tip tip eight I've got ten tips so I'll rush as fast as I can how you start will be how you finish. My auntie Tessie, Lord, Lord rest her, she's now dead and buried. She said to me on my wedding day, Caroline, how you start is how you finish. Get a cup of tea in bed every morning. And I held my husband to that to this day. And she was right, you know, and how you start is how you finish. This is a typical life cycle of a private practice. What do you notice at maturity? If you look here, what you notice is you start to drop down in your revenue. What we know from our benchmarking of our doctors is the most critical time for you is at the start. Tell the market who you are or the market will decide. I had an ophthalmologist once and she said to me, she's not a client currently, and she said to me, I'm seeing children all the time and I never bloody wanted to see kids. I want to see cataracts and do whatever. And I said, it's your fault because you didn't tell the market what you are. So you accepted every child that walked through the door and didn't educate your GP, so they just kept seeing you makes sense so how you start will be how you finish when we see doctors act and build good befitting relationships at the start this is what we see happen so we see that their revenue will go higher at the start and what's interesting here is at maturity you still don't go up you only go up if you take on associates or do other things to leverage your business but you don't drop down and what age do you think you're at when you enter maturity 
Oh, you can't answer that today because obviously I'm not with you, but 52 is the average. So 52, that's why that phone call's ringing for me. The older surgeon who's saying, I'm unhappy, it's not working because their revenue is dropping off and they're feeling the pinch. And by now they've got four kids at private schools or whatever's happening in their lives. It's really hard to take a hit at that point. So think about that, how you start will be how you finish. Tip nine, trust us to do it. You know, here's doctors, whether it's me or somebody else, but trust somebody else who's an expert to do it for you. Here's some doctors that we've worked for before. I can tell you, I've got pages and pages, like thousands of doctors. So we might get to that at the end, if that's, uh, that's possible. Um, yeah. We can go through some of that in our Q&A. Yeah, yeah. One more to go. Last one. Yeah. Think about you, what makes you happy. It's a short life. We're all going out in a box. You've studied really hard. Make it what you want. Little by little, step by step, design the life you want it to be. Think about that and come and see me. I'm happy to meet with you. Okay, I'm done. Thank, thank you very much, Caroline, for a very informative and um, detailed talk. And I'm sure there'll be questions uh, and I'll address the, and make sure the att attendees are uh, right the questions in and we'll send it off to you. Um, I've changed my background because you mentioned the, the greatest quote ever in movies and that is uh, you build it and they will come. Uh, so this is from Field of Dreams and uh, hopefully you guys will all reach your field of dreams by doing what uh, all the speakers have been telling you over the past few weeks. Now I'd like to introduce my co-convener, uh, Marilyn Raj, who will introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nicole Yap. Marilyn. Thanks very much, Patrick. So next we have um, sharing her perspectives on um, um, room set up and private practice, uh, Dr. Nicole Yap. So Nicole, um, welcome. And um, uh, we're very happy for you to um, enlighten us on uh, um, how you've gone about um, um, attacking this um, uh, rather tricky area of um, private practice. So, building a referral base. Uh, I think after Carolyn's gone through uh, all the setup and fit outs, it's exhausting. So, uh, building a referral base is actually a little bit more work that needs to be done. And in fact, if you think that you're going to be able to uh, start a practice to it, as you can now see. So, uh, private practice, uh, Carolyn's gone through all this, you're sitting in your new room, you've done your fit out, you've sorted out your staff, you're, you're, you're pretty much exhausted. And then you've got to turn around and you're twiddling your thumbs thinking, I've just come from a massive public practice where I'm on call all the time, I'm working my butt off, and now I'm doing nothing and I know everything because I've come back from my fellowship. Why aren't people referring to me? Well, what do you do next? You've got a lot of raw enthusiasm at this point. So who do you turn to? Well, you can come to one of these meetings and you can say, okay, uh, we'll listen to this and see what I can do. Um, or webinars as it is at this point of time with COVID-19. Or you can turn to your mentor. And the mentor is quite good because the mentor might be thinking of retiring. So they've got a lot of ideas that they think that they might be able to help you with because they have, they're not going to be competing with you. Colleagues can be helpful. When I started, and that's how we started the private practice course, we got together and tried to work out how can we achieve these things, but beware the competition. So this is my, one of my mentors. And uh, we're at the Epworth Ball at this particular point of time. We're not just doing dress up. So building a referral base is similar or akin to creating the foundation of a relationship. It's a relationship that you require. So GPs and specialists have a really unique relationship with this, which is symbiotic and it exists quite between these two persons Neither can exist without the other. And that's the most important thing. The other important thing is that GPs want to be confident that their referrals will benefit their patients and also reflect on how good their practice is. Because if the patient's happy, they think the GP is wonderful. And this is super important. So referral and relationship marketing is 
akin to delivering value and maintaining also the relationship. There's no point just creating a relationship and not maintain it. It's important to think not what you can get out of it, but really how can you serve and care about others, be it the patient, but also the GP. So you need to combine all your strategies and systems to help benefit and nurture these relationships. Will you say, so what is medical marketing? So I was looking around for a description. So marketing in itself is the activity and processes for creating, communicating and delivering value and managing relationships in ways that benefit customers, partners, and in this situation, patients and GPs. So when you first start out, you might find that someone who's retiring or going on long service leave needs someone to take over their practice for a prolonged medium term. So those sorts of situations are quite good because you can go along and then you can take up those referring doctors because they automatically will be referring to that practice and they can get to know you and how you work and some of them might stick with you because they like the way you practice. So that's one way. When you, become, when you get accredited at private hospitals, they're very keen to market you. Why? Because you're bringing in money to the hospital. So you'll get introduced in their newsletters. They have GP flyers that they send out and you give them the information so they can put it within the flyer. They may create, this is pre-COVID, GP visits, uh, presentations to a group of GPs that might come from different practices. And in some places, they do little workshops, so suturing workshops, so it's hands-on, it's enjoyable uh, for the GPs to come and do things, plastering workshops, especially if you're an orthopod and you might get this. So you have a more of a relaxed manner of getting yourself known to the GPs rather than just, uh, the, just the formal talk. Word of mouth, super important. So if you... Uh, uh, affable and so uh, you get on well with people especially your patients they will develop a rapport with you which is super important and that goes back to the GP so the patients talk amongst themselves and their friends and their family and you get known that way and also when they talk to the GPs within the practice the, the GP goes oh this is wonderful I'm looking pretty good tells their colleagues that this is the case and then they might start Mark, uh, referring to you as well Advertising, of course, is another way of marketing, and this could be by paper, uh, when you can send, you yourself can send out flyers to practices, but also now digital with the internet, your website, Facebook, social media, and of course, blog and Twittering. You've got to be careful in this uh, area, and this is another area that we can talk about at a later time. Uh, there am I doing some talking. So. Some of us feel when we leave that we feel a little bit uncomfortable about the notion of building a relationship. We think, well, why can't we just go and just say, this is what I do, send the patients to me? Because there's a lot of people doing what you're doing, that's why. And why should the GP send the patient to you and not Joe Blow down the road? So you have to remember that you're not selling, it's not a transactional thing that you're doing, but actually a bi-directional benefit of taking care of the people who are taking care of you. Have to be Wonder Woman. So I, res I revert back to the three pillars of excellence, i.e. availability, affability, and ability. So availability, you need to set up a good communication with the GPs, so, i.e. you could be a, allow them to have your private mobile number so that out of hours they can call you directly or such as some GPs work in the evenings, sometimes they work uh, on the weekends and they work part-time shifts and it's really nice to get their patients sorted at the time that they're seeing them. So if you're available then, uh, you not, might not be on call, but you're available to talk to, it's to really, really good for them and they really appreciate it. So does the patient. So I've done that. I've even come in uh, for a cancer patient on a public holiday just because I think it's super important. I wasn't doing anything specific. I was doing my um, running around the block at the time. So I may as well just run into work and see the patient and they appreciate it. And so does the GP. Affability. So everyone likes to talk to someone they get on with. And 
why would you choose someone that you didn't didn't like you thought was a bit cold a bit arrogant um could do the job just as well as a person that's more affable so why not choose the affable person so remember that when you come across with gps because they always feel oh you know the specialist might be a bit better than me might think they're better than me no one's better than anyone we work as a team and of course needless to say it's important to have ability Harking back to communication, I've just mentioned availability, feedback. Feedback is really important. The timing of feedback to the GP. So uh, are you going to just wait, allow them to wait for when your dictated letter gets sent to them? Or are you going to use uh, better methods such as uh, electronic methods, uh, which are a bit faster? Are you going to give them a call? Why not call them? I do that when uh, there's a situation which uh, the patient, I've just diagnosed them with potentially cancer and an operation is imminent. It's really important that the GP is aware of it because they're not going to find out about this between the time that you've told the patient and the time you're going to operate on them. And bear in mind, the patient has a much better rapport with their GP because they've known them for a much longer time. They may, because if they're really anxious, go to the GP and want to talk about it. So the GP's job is to uh, know about what's going on and they really appreciate it if you give them the heads up so they don't look sort of silly when the patient comes in and says oh I've got a cancer I'm going to be operating on do you, what do you think so I think it's really important uh, to just let the GP know a simple phone call will suffice and if you have a really good uh, communication situation set up even an SMS saying hey uh, this is what's happening just letting you know uh, the other issue is with medical legal issues, but that goes a little bit beyond uh, issues with a uh, referral base. So there are two key relationship goals. One is retention of the referrer. So it's all very well getting a referral, referrer and they're with you for a period of time. And then once you get relaxed, you think, oh, well, do I need to continue with this? But it's really important there are other people coming up and they're wanting that GP as well. So you need to pay attention to existing referrer base. It's super important. You just don't let them go. If you can help it. Referrer growth, of course, everyone's interested in that and that's getting you referrals. The sub goals. So branding. How you manage your reputation through branding is in being genuine in how you present yourself, both in person, if you happen to see the GP uh, at their practice, on your website, and through social media. Social media is very important. You've got to, be very, uh, got to be very careful about your reputation. So also in your personal social media, be careful, check on that. Make sure there's nothing there that a patient might see. Sometimes it's, you don't want to be too relaxed on social media in these circumstances because you are supposed to be the one, the person that knows what they're doing. You're in charge of their life. That's what's happening. They don't want someone who looks like they're out drinking and getting drunk. So uh, you just have to do that quietly and not put it on social media. The other issue is consistency. So consistent service and consistency with good patient experience and referral outreach, not just in the tough times, but keep it going through the good times. Because remember, it's very easy for them to change referrers if they find they're more valued by someone else. The other issue is reviewing and planning your marketing strategies. You need to be consistent with it. So you need to make sure that it's going along as you predict. It's all very well starting it and then thinking, oh, this is good. And then thinking, oh, I'll just continue in this way. I don't need to review it. You need to, you need to know what's happening. You need to know if referrers are dropping off. You need to know why they're dropping off. And you need to address those issues early, not late, because if it's late, you're going to lose them. One of the big questions is, you have to know in your heart of hearts why do if you were the GP why would they refer to you what is the reason you need to be able to tell them that well not exactly but in your head you need to know so one way of doing that is to differentiate your practice for example 
if you're a urologist, uh, is it your area in women's incontinence or are you a cancer surgeon mainly? Uh, in orthopedics, are you an upper limb or a lower limb uh, surgeon? What are the areas that you specialize in? If you're a thyroid surgeon, are you into robotic surgery compared to not? So you need to be, uh, you need to push those points. What differentiates you from the next person that's in your area of expertise? The other thing is when you present yourself, how do you present yourself? How do you come across? We touched on this before. Are you affable or are you arrogant? And you might not think you're arrogant. You might just think you're being very officious, but you might be coming across as arrogant. And people don't like that. They couldn't be bothered. They've got someone else they can go to that's not. Are you a good communicator or you are very quiet? You think, oh, well, I know everything. I don't need to tell you. GPs like to learn from you and they like to feel that you are being involved with them and that they're part of the team. And they can't be part of the team if you don't give them an idea of where the management is going in that particular case. You also have to be truly knowledgeable because people pick up on the fact that if you just all talk and no action or no show, that they lose interest in you. So whether it's a patient or whether it's a GP, know your facts, know what you're talking about, don't over exaggerate. So you should know why you should be the first choice. Now branding. Branding is not just a logo, but what the GP and patients and other people tell each other about you and your practice and your values. Your room's presentation, as Caroline has mentioned, it's extremely important. How do you present yourself? Are you going to be like um, Edelson's, it's not Edelson's, it's Edelson's, grand piano and chandelier versus a smart but understated uh, look? Is that how you want to present? Which way do you want to present? Because that will reflect on your practice whether you think it or not. People will think, well, if they like this, in their presentation in their real life, they may operate like this too, which is probably not the fact, but that's how it comes across. That's their perception. So your brand is what other people say about you when you are not in the room. So it all comes back to rapport. Rapport is loyalty and trust, both with patients and GPs. So there's a variety of ways you can create that through digital uh, marketing and through media or just from just normal paperwork, which we've touched on. Collateral information, very important, your website. Your website needs to, is probably the first port of call. Sure, you can have brochures in your rooms talking about uh, the sort of areas that you do. People can pick them up. You can send them uh, to GPs. Uh, the other things are interactive online questionnaires. So you can get a feel what uh, people want, uh, how they feel about your practice, information surveys, so you can see what uh, they, they would like to know about and you can focus on that and be directive. And you can do all this through different platforms on the social media, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, and it's also important to engage with target markets, know your market, whether you are a male or female or both. Uh, your age demographics, as was touched on before, whether it's paediatrics or more elderly or a general run of, uh, uh, of some, like for me, for example, breast work, it's, it's a whole range of ages. So that's important that you know about it. Now, now it's now COVID-19. So COVID-19 has changed the landscape somewhat uh, with regards to uh, marketing, medical marketing and uh, obtaining uh, a referral base, especially if you're coming out now, it's really changed because of the um, issues with uh, face to face. Digital marketing has come to the forefront. So getting back to website, websites can be the first impression of you as a specialist and as a person. Do so you need to get it right? You need to make sure that the information is correct and that eight, be aware that eight out of 10 people, it's not will visit the website before they visit you. That's even if they've been referred to you. So if you're going to put photos and videos on it, make them look good. Make them, don't have this crappy resolution going on. It will consolidate what people think of you and their, perception, and their perception of your work, which drives the referral.
So a visual digital, a visual digital presence is super important. 85% of people contact businesses found in local searches. It's important to, to organize your SEO, the search engine optimization. You need to target your marketing. Um, digital presence is efficient, it's effective, it's lower cost than paper marketing. It can also measure and track the benefit of your marketing. So most people will perform a digital and email marketing check on you even if they've already been referred to you remember that these days and even more so now that COVID-19 has occurred. With regards to digital marketing, the it's important uh, in, in certain aspects. So you can do webinar information, just what, like what we're doing now. You can set up an automated communication module, i.e. an email message, pre-procedure, and even post-op information can be achieved like that. Uh, letters can be um, sent by email marketing. So you can have a letter in the form of uh, advertising for your procedure or uh, how the uh, post-op um, information should be and you send that by email marketing. With regards to seeing GPs in their practices uh, with COVID-19, um, I've started doing Zoom meetings and that's with or without lunch. So it just depends on the GPs what they'd like to do. And they've found that quite good because I'll come in at the normal time that they see you if you were visiting them and we have this set up. And in fact, it's sometimes a bit better because they really have to concentrate on what you're talking about because you're just on the screen and they can't be distracted because it looks like they're distracted. In fact, I did one just recently and uh, I was in the room, the lunch room, and, some, and one of them was too busy eating. So I, I said, Oh, you, you're not concentrating on me. And uh, they were, oh, 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 I am. And I said, no, 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 you, you, I couldn't see you because so they turned the screen around. And uh, so I had all their attention, which is very rare if you're face to face. It's not as they can sort of get sidetracked. So this is much better, I think. Your team matters. Train your team to go the extra mile. Build it into a regular practice. Your team is those that work with you, uh, in my case, a breast care nurse, uh, my girls in the rooms. It starts from the first, the person that answers the phone. So train them all on the phone. Just little things like if the patient's coming, tell them exactly where it is. It's at the, on the fourth floor above the pharmacy uh, so they have a better idea. They're not look, searching all over the place. They know that they have to get their temperature checked, that they have to wear a mask when they come in and where they can park the car, what's close by. Uh, also, uh, even public transport that's close by. It's these little things patients really like and that, go, that gets fed, fed, fed back to the GP. And so that's really important for your practice. The other thing is let the GPs feel they're included in the care of their patients. Uh, they are also part of the team and, and they feel really good when they're part of the team. So it's really important that you send prompt and easily understandable reports or letters with key information that, that, that the GPs want because they'll appreciate that. As I said before, actions speak louder than words. Do not overpromise and under deliver. If you do it once, that's the end. Like no one can, you're, you're never forgiven. You don't get a second chance. Just stick with being genuine. Provide high quality of care and treat all patients and staff with respect. It's always important because at the end of the day, all these people, including the staff and the staff of GP practices, will be the ones that will be suggesting to their patients that you're the one to go to. It's always important to take time with people. That's super important. It makes them feel valued. That's my staff, um, Christmas dinner. So basically the common referral mistakes are everything that I've said, but to the negative. So really there's not much more to, to suggest. You're going to have when you come out to practice while you're waiting for your referrals, time on your hands, enjoy it, it won't last long. Assist your colleagues, uh, do some teaching, get involved with the college activities as we've been doing, and that will fulfill you for a period of time, it's not forever, and then when you get busy, you just wish you enjoyed that time off. So in summary, make sure that the experience you provide 
is the experience you want to provide or would like provided to you if you were in the other shoes. Manage your reputation through genuine branding because that's how you're perceived. Have an effective team. And also, it's really important that everything is consistently working together to drive the same values or everyone, not everything, everyone is consistently working together to drive the same values and the level of quality that is high. And know your top referrers, know who's referring to you, know if they're not happy and know how to address that issue. Keep that high level of service and consistent marketing through both the tough and the good times to maintain these referrers. It's tiger time out there. So good luck. Thanks very much, Nicole, um, for all those enlightening comments um, and um, guidance tips for everyone um, who is starting off and trying to succeed in building a referral break base. Um, I'd like to firstly thank both Carolyn and Nicole for their valuable perspectives. Caroline, thank you for highlighting the importance of actually asking for professional help um, if uh, young fellows are wanting to set up their own rooms um, and the, um, the important things to consider. Um, and, and it sounds like, you know, one of the big take-home messages from there is create something in terms of a, an office environment that you would feel comfortable um, going in with your family member if you were wanting to, to see a, a specialist. Um, and, you know, ensure that uh, you cut your coat according to your cloth in terms of your financial situation. Um, it may be that you start off with something that is more, more modest uh, at the start and then you can proceed to have the million dollar establishment um, as your private rooms, as your career builds. Um, but you know, um, step by step is, um, is probably the best way to go. Nicole, um, your perspectives on building a referral base, um, such valuable insights about the do's and don'ts of um, over-promising and under-delivering, um, which I think as uh, fellows start off in private practice, there is such a, um, an eagerness to become successful and to have lots and lots of refer doctors, GPs referring to us, but sometimes we forget that um, quality service is better than quantity. Um, now on that note, I would um, like to invite my co-moderator, Mr. Patrick Lowe, who has had um, uh, significant years of experience in um, building his uh, private practice. And Patrick, would you be happy to share some of your insights um, on these two topics that um, the fellows can take away and, and um, hopefully will help them when they, um, when they look at these two areas? Oh, thank you very much, Marilyn. I'm feeling aged already. Um, before I go on, I'd like to actually thank Nicole because she has been one of the driving forces in the P4P all these years. Thank you for handing this over to us uh, on a platter, as, as, you, as you were. Um, it's been fantastic. It's a different world now with the webinars. So um, thank you again for, for your time. I don't have much to say. Both Caroline and uh, Nicole, excellent talks. And I hope everyone listen in on that and take the, the, the little, little uh, pearls of wisdom that has been offered. Um, from my point of view, I totally echo everything um, both uh, speakers have uh, stated today, get to know your GPs because they are your referrers, but more importantly, get to know your patients because they're the one who are going to be your billboards. You know, if you uh, are nice to your GPs and they come, keep coming back and keep referring patients to you, and then suddenly you, something happens to one of the patients, they're going to pass that message back to the GP and suddenly you have two years without the referral from the GP you go, what? What happened? Yeah, I sent I sent flyers to them. I have uh, lunch webinars with them. How come they're not uh, re returning uh, the the favour and sending patients to me? It's because you don't get to know your patients, and to that extent, you have got to know your ability and do your job. That's that's your greatest advertisement. We can sit and make them world's most beautiful websites and. Uh, 
you know, send out fantastic flyers. And there's a lot, lot of people in Sydney who do that. And until you do your job, no amount of those little fancy stuff is going to bring the world to you. So just do your job. That's the most important thing. The second most important thing, or in fact, it should be number one, is staff, staff, staff. They are your first port of call, and they are your advertisement. Yeah, you know, if you've got the staff who, like Caroline uh, stated, uh, were essentially part-time secretarial staff and then slowly been there for 10 years, and then suddenly they become a practice manager, and they take on all these calls, if they're not personable and not affable and uh, don't do the job as a proper manager, you will never see patients from those practices ever. And then suddenly, you know, from seeing 20 patients a, a day, you come back to you know, seeing two a day. You know, what, what happened there? Um, and lastly, please don't be disheartened. Uh, again, as Caroline's chart said, the first two years, absolutely horrible. You're twiddling your thumb, but that is actually quite good because you've worked, you've studied for 10, 12, 15 years to get to where you are, and then suddenly, oh, great, I'm going to earn some money. Well, use that time, as Nicole said, get involved in other stuff. You know, get that work-life balance because very soon, you're going to not know what the time of day is. You're going to see patients at 6 a.m. in the morning. You operate the whole day. You finish up, and you go, oh, hang on, I've got rooms to see, you know, rooms to do, and maybe in the new world, you've got, you've got webinars to go to, or, you know, seeing patients on Zoom you know, at nine o'clock, and you go, oh, far out. Remember those days when I could go and play baseball? You know, remember those days when I could actually sit and watch a movie? Oh, what are those? What are those things? So just take some time for yourself. It's a very, it's a difficult balance, but you will find your own way. But please, please, please don't be disheartened for that first two years. It is... Like any small business, it is so horrible. And you just say, that's it. I'm not going to be able to feed my children, let alone my dog. Okay? So use, use your time wisely. Listen to what the, the great speakers have said today. And um, good luck with everything. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, so we've got uh, some questions that have been um, um, sent in by the um, attendees. And um, I might... Um, uh, start with those now. So the first one um, I might direct towards you, Nicole, and that is um, how do you approach and manage referrers who are dropping off? Um, what's your sort of, um, you know, tactic for dealing with that? Um, I, I, that's, the, that's actually quite difficult because the first thing you have to work out is why. And uh, it depends on number one, your interpersonal relationship with the GP, and it, which usually isn't as great because they would have told you by the stage if you had a good relationship, a really good relationship. Um, but, but sometimes they feel a bit shy and really they're just protecting themselves. They actually want to uh, look good in front of the patient and they side with the patient and that's usually the case, even if the patient's a little bit not quite right. So I think that's why I like to approach this fairly soon after the event and so it doesn't sort of get prolonged so sometimes it's uh, if you can find out that the it's a, just an in, interrelationship or a lack of rapport with the patient I actually tell I ask I ask the GP what's going on it, was there a problem uh, um, is there something you'd like me to do uh, I'm not quite sure. I haven't heard from you for a while. Um, can I come and visit you? Um, you know, I'll, I'll bring some lunch or coffee if that's the case. It depends, you know, what times we're in. Um, it's a bit difficult with COVID because I always like the personal touch. I like to be able to go and talk in person and I think you get a much better result. But we've got to do what we've got to do. So I can do it either on FaceTime or Zoom or, or some other device where they can actually see me. And they can see how I'm feeling too because they can see from the face how I'm feeling. Uh, and if I look, uh, if they say something and I was, I'm was, i surprised and I'm genuinely surprised about uh, what had happened, uh, potentially say to a patient and one of theirs, and I, I'm like, oh, well, this is what happened on my side of the story. If they're someone who's reasonable and logical, they will actually come around a bit. So I've had one in that situation where the patient was... Uh, um, had some 
body image issues, which were true body image issues, and uh, nothing you could do uh, would satisfy them. And didn't matter what. And so they took it out as they usually do on a third party. It happened to me on that occasion. So I went back to the GP who really didn't quite understand what was going on, thought I'd done the wrong thing. And I came back to them and I said, well, in that case, that's this is the situation. This is what's going on. Uh, you don't see it. And eventually they said, yes, yes, we agree with you because some other situation had arisen with some other person that it got as a second opinion and uh, and it continued so it wasn't just me so I said so it t took a little while it probably took about a year but they've come back now uh, and uh, they started referring again but it's really annoying when those sorts of situations happen because it's really beyond your control and sometimes you just got to accept it thanks Nicole um, yeah they, they are tough situations and I think um, communication is probably the best way to work out what exactly the reason behind the call off? So, um, mm. yeah. Marilyn, um, if I can say something there too, yeah, if that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. What we find is, as Nicole said, it's hard to find out exactly why, but if we see numbers drop off from a particular referral, what we found in our experience is that typically it's just that they were in a pattern with someone else. So they referred a few times and then just accidentally went back to old patterns. Um, so it's often nothing sort of sinister you've done or anything that way. So what we suggest is send them something of value because really you're in a sales situation. You're selling yourself to the doctor. It might sound tacky to say that in medicine, but it really is true that we're all in a sales situation. So go back to the, the GP and send them something of value. So not how come you haven't contacted me? Why aren't you answering my letters? That sort of thing. Don't use that tack. Use instead... Uh, you know, some information that's gone out to other GPs um, I've got, I thought it might be of interest to you. Um, can I share scre uh, screen share for a moment and I'll show you an example? Yeah. If that's all right with you. So I'll show you. The host has just disabled screen sharing for a minute. I can't get in. Yeah, I don't think that, uh, that oh, we can do that. I do, Caroline, while, yeah. whilst um, we sort that out, I, I do have another question that has um, come up that I'd like you to um, um, give us your response to and then Nicole, if you don't mind. So that is that now with COVID, and not just with COVID, but we're sort of in a, in a, in a, digital, uh, in, in a digital and social media driven age. How has that altered how you advise people in terms of setting up their surgical practice? Could you comment on that, Caroline? And then, Nicole, I might get yeah. you to comment on that as well. Well, from a website point of view, mm -hmm. um, making sure your website can be found. So making sure that you've got some SEO plugins and um, uh, words and so forth on your website that you can be found. Mm -hmm. If you're in a highly competitive space, you might look at an AdWords campaign so you can be found more read readily. Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, the online solution. Mm -hmm. In relation to um, the referrers, really not much has changed. GPs still like uh, to press the flesh, whether or not that's actually physically or online. Um, as Nicole said, their mindset has changed a lot more towards, you know, people doing telehealth and everything. So this isn't as foreign anymore. They still want the relationship. Um, I see a lot of doctors who are doing tacky things like being on the back of shopper dockets. Um, it's not befitting. It's not, you're not supposed to do it for a start as well. Uh, it's all about creating befitting relationships. I like to call referral marketing dating for doctors. Think of it like this. You don't just ask someone on a date and then say, great, do you want to get married? Unless you're, unless you're NQR. But you, most people know that this is not the right thing to do. So you build a relationship. And a principle of marketing that we follow is seven marketing touches to make a change. So if someone is already in a staunch referral pattern with someone else, they will need to hear, touch, taste, smell you seven times um, to be able to make a change. They're not just going to say, oh, Nicole sent a letter drop everything, let's refer to Nicole. The only time that's different is if there's no one else in the area or someone's retired or become sick or something and there's an opportunity. So look for those seven marketing touches and make it very bespoke. I always think of it like this. If you're going on a date with somebody and you're trying to impress a lady, let's say, and you've been on a couple of dates and then you say, you know what? I knew your birthday was coming up and I noticed that you used Jolie hand cream. 
So I bought you one. I hope you like that. That's looking at what they need. That's looking at their own particular needs. It's no different in the medical world. So what I was about to show you a minute ago was a podcast from an, an obstetrician where the obstetrician has gone out and had a lunch or an edu session like this and they've asked their referrers, you know, what is it you need? What can I do for you? The referrers come back and said, I need, you know, information on X. And then she's written back and said, hey, guess what? I've made a podcast for you. It's really easy. It's simple to listen to. Um, I've done this for you. I hope it's a benefit to your practice. That's what the Jolie Can Cream method is, if you like. And so it's thinking about what they need, not just what you need. Thanks, Caroline. Nicole, can I just ask you to make a comment about the, um, you know, the, the, what you spoke about in terms of the social media and, and the digital marketing? Um, sort of what are your views on that and any tips? I think you have to be very careful in the advertising world to stick with the law. That's the first thing. So, um, but I noticed you mentioned before about what you do about bad reviews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a difficult area. Uh, it's become less difficult now that uh, they've said that Google does have to declare uh, the person who's sending it because uh, I was talking to some of my medical indemnity uh, friends. I just so happen to have them. They're lawyers that work in, in a variety of um, medical indemnity um, groups. And they said that the uh, there is probably more of uh, from professional jealousy is coming from your colleagues that are putting these reviews in actually patients. Because in general, you'd know about the patients. Because if you had a patient that was unhappy, you'd know about it and you'd know this case and you'd know that there was a problem. So uh, I'm not saying this was a, a, a colleague, but I had one situation where they said that it was somebody and they put down a false name, I assume, I'm not sure, but I looked them up on, on my um, system and there was no patient by that name. And they'd said something along the lines of, I didn't deal with difficult situations. Uh, not, it was very vague. And uh, I, I just thought something's not quite right here. And I hadn't had any patient that at that point of time that, uh, that had a problem uh, with me or their procedure or anything else. So I'm trying to rack my brains, who could this be out of the blue? Anyway, I looked at it and they said, you know, we, I tried to contact you and you won't uh, reply to anything and you're useless from that respect. So then we, I decided to turn that around and I said, well, uh, first of all, I worked out that either it's a, a, um, a um, competing colleague or it's um, an, a weird person that just happened to decide to attack me online uh, for whatever their reason was. So I, so I said, right, so I addressed the issue and I didn't ask Google to take it down. I just went, oh, I didn't even decide to ask them who it was. I just went, okay, in fact, you obviously haven't gone across uh, the variety of methods uh, approach that you can get onto me uh, via this practice. And I listed it all and they said how they could get to me 24 seven. And this is the email and this is the, uh, the way to approach it. And in fact, it was like a marketing exercise for me in a very positive way. So everything that they said, I addressed in a positive manner and it became, it turned it all around. So of course they weren't going to come back to me because they were pretty stupid how they addressed it in the first place. So um, that was how I achieved that result in, in that way. But um, other people might have different experiences to that. Okay, thanks, Nicole. We do have another question that's popped up from the attendees and that is, how do you use us speaking a second language as a selling point in your marketing efforts? Oh, I think that's a, that's a, a great uh, selling point. And especially if you want to market to the people who speak that language, for example, you might not want to, but, um, but uh, let's just say Chinese, for example. So um, there are a lot of people that find it more comfortable speaking in their own uh, their primary language. And so uh, that would be a very good selling point. How, how, would you, how would you recommend then, um, say Caroline, how would you recommend we advertise 
prioritise that fact? Um, you know, is it something that you only get your staff to talk about when they ring up to make the appointment? Should it be, you know, advertised on your uh, website? What, what What's your perspectives on that? Well, firstly, to the general public, advertising on your website that you speak two languages is great. Um, you can, people sometimes use Google Translate. I'd suggest be careful of that because sometimes it'll translate things and medically it's not correct. So be careful in that space, but you can have some pages that have been translated directly to your GP. Um, what we do is send out letters and basically tell people that that's, that's what you do. And then particularly if it's pertinent to, a, to an area, it might be that you can offer assistance to uh, go and do a talk at, um, uh, a certain facility that has a certain demographic or, or, or uh, culture and you can, um, you know, offer your services and you can speak in the language of the attendees. That, that's also good. So letting people know mostly through um, the paper that goes through, um, you'll find it very difficult to get GP's emails and if you do get one or a practice manager, you'll find it won't get through through they absolutely love their fax machine <laughs> they think their fax machine is, is the bee's knees so you send a letter we would ring up say again and then we'd say oh did you get that information oh no you didn't let me send it through again and keep in mind at that point that the gatekeepers at a gp practice are very important um, so if they like you they're more likely to, to um, pass you on or you know refer you on to the doctors there uh, just with security though uh i believe that the fax is better than an email mm -hmm. unless you have an encrypted email that's like cool. Argus for example. Mm. Yeah that's exactly right. Thanks um thanks very much um to both Caroline and Nicole um for firstly taking the time to um present today and also for um you know um providing their honest um and um experienced answers um in terms of you know sharing their personal experiences on some of the, um, um, the the questions that have been um, asked today. Um, Patrick, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, before we um, finish up today's webinar? No, no, it's been a very informative webinar. Very um, well presented. Thank you to the, to the speakers. Thanks very much. Um, look, in terms of um, the um, remaining webinars for the Prep for Practice series. Our next one is actually next Tuesday. It's um, on health and well-being, which um, it may not seem um, super important and high on your list of priorities, but um, you know that old adage that says that uh, you're going to be the best doctor if you actually look after yourself um, first. I think I have come to appreciate how important that is. So. We would encourage you all to actually tune in next Tuesday um, at 7 p.m. for that really important um, uh, webinar. Um, today's webinar will be available to download from the college website. Obviously, we always love to have your feedback on um, what you thought. So, you know, please complete the surveys. Um, and if you've got any further questions that you would like to ask um, on today's topics, please send them in uh, and we will send them on th through to our presenters and have responses back to you. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to say again, a massive thank you to all our speakers um, and also to um, Virginia and Catherine who do an enormous behind the scenes work to run, make sure every webinar runs um, uh, perfectly. Um, and we'll see you all next Tuesday. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks Thank all. you.